before we start in on that. Uh, Jackie has had a pretty good day. He learned some things that were better yesterday or the day before. He got some bad news about his kidneys, but that's better today than it was. And another one of them big long words that I can't say, his level was low, but it is, and it's still low. And they thought he had internal bleeding. But today, they don't think he has internal bleeding. And that one level that's low, they think those problems are related. His body's really low on iron, and so he's not making enough blood, and that's why he's getting uh, uh, in the shape he's in. So they're hopefully they're figuring some things out, but he does feel better. They took a bunch of fluid off him, but he needs a lot of prayer. They're going to keep him in the hospital a few days, see if they can get some things figured out. And... Uh, of course, little Simon Rowley, I don't know exactly if there's been a major update today, but he was off the ventilator, and uh, he's a miracle baby, but he uh, he still needs a lot of prayer. And my, do you know Mike's last name, Ricky, the fellow that got the blood disease? You told me earlier. I did, too. Oh, uh, Mike G. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Mike's got a blood disorder, and uh, he he's really weak and really struggling. That needs a lot of prayer. And there's a young lady missing in Ohio named Madison, but we don't know her last name. Anybody else got a prayer request or a yeah, prayer? Mom and daddy, young man. Mama's kidney's twisted today. Oh, and, uh, man. She's just not doing well at all. Of course, she's had a lot of time with him. So. I understand. I'm put the Rebecca's grandmother on there. That's why. That's like, what was her first name? Uh, Juanita. Juanita. Wow. Her hip was broken and uh, they operated on her today. I don't know what that is. How the world you spell Wani? With a J. J. A. Yes, sir. Uh, I just got a text from Rebecca. She's asking to get an off call, but they took her great back and she, I think she was talking to her hip or back and it's going to take three or four hours. So she's in surgery now. Okay, so that's Miss Juanita, right? Yeah. She's in surgery right now. All right, so we'll pray a special prayer for her. She's doing so well. That's right. Miss Natalie. Uh, Jenna Roberts, Judy, that's Matt Roberts' little sister, had her baby last night. She weighed two pounds. Is he doing good? Mm -hmm. the, what was the last name? Judy? Judy, Judy baby. J-U-D-Y. <laughs> I appreciate that, Pete. I was kind of stunned there for a minute. <laughs> Joe and Sheila Scott. Anybody else? Uh, Sue Lathrop. Miss Sue Lathrop has got the same sort of thing. Got all kinds of ailments right now. Bless her Lord. Remember That's right, Doc. Donald Wayne Goodlett needs a lot of prayer. He's had a lot of trouble. Basically, the same thing Jackie got. That's pretty much right. Don says Mr. Khan, C O N N, had a mini stroke. Mr. Khan. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, put my mom, Bonnie Tingle, on there. She's got her uh, battery changed out in her pacemaker tomorrow. All right. And she's got to be over there for like five hours and nobody can go in there. Yes, ma'am. That's a tough thing there. Um, Rose Hill. And it's a praise report that we're here and that everybody can be with us on the internet and everything. It's just, that's a praise. Keep the prayers up in your prayers. That's right. 
definitely keep the churches, not just our church, but the churches and all the leaders of the churches, because right now it's really hard to make everything work for everybody. Anybody else? You got straight me out. Did you get in the wrong chair? There's one in every trail. That's, uh, that's me. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anything else before we open up? I know there are unspoken requests, a whole bunch of unspoken requests. bow with me. I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our God and our Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house tonight, God, and I'm just so thankful to be here, Father God, and I, I, while ago, Lord, me and Emma was sitting here waiting, Lord, and we had the door open and the wind was up and we was listening to the birds sing and the wind blow through the to live in this country, Lord. I thank you for the freedom of uh, religion, Father God. I, I thank you for the right to worship. I thank you, Father God, for the rights of mankind and our freedom, Father God. I thank you for what it costs to get that. I thank you, Father God, for this church and for just everybody that's gathered here in person, everybody that's gathered with us on Facebook. I just ask you, Father God, that I know there's some out maybe here and there that's got a need on their heart that they don't even know how to, to put into words, Lord, but we ask you to be with them. We ask you to touch their hearts tonight. We ask you, Father God, that you would be with us all because I know there's a lot of worries and we live in a time, Lord, with a lot of unanswered questions. Tonight, I especially ask you to be with our country. Father God, I think that sometimes people get tired of hearing about repentance, but Lord, until our country repents, there ain't much else we can do, Father God. Your hands are tied until we turn back to you. Father, you will, not, you will not put your favor on the people that are disobedient, and I know that, Father God. And, I just thank you for all those who are seeking you, Father, and I just pray that it would make a turn in our nation. I pray for revival, Lord. This Sunday, that's going to be the theme of our message is revival. And Lord, I do pray for a great revival in this nation, and I pray, Lord, it would start in our hearts. And Lord, we ask you to be with all those we've mentioned, and we especially ask you to be with Miss Juanita, Lord. Lord, she's in surgery right now, and Lord, she's in a desperate need of help. And I just pray that you guide those doctors' hands and minds and you touch and heal her. And, Lord, we thank you for little Simon and just ask you to continue to heal him. And I thank you, Lord, for Jackie, Lord, because last night I was really concerned about Jackie. Lord, he was in a tough way, but you blessed him, and I thank you for that. Just ask you to be with us tonight as we open your great and powerful word. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the ultimate truth, and I have no idea what we'd do without it. But, Lord, I thank you so much for it. And I just ask you to hide me behind the cross. And and Lord, I just I just pray tonight what happens to be to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, my lovely wife forgot to send out to tell everybody to bring your Sunday school book tonight. So if you don't have it, well, you can follow oh, along because we're going to be in Galatians chapter five. <laughs> and after we don't have but a few lessons left in this Sunday school book, and then we'll probably go back to. Uh, doing Joel on Wednesday night in a, in a few more weeks and then and I, I might do the Sunday school lesson via the internet uh, but until we get that all figured out we're going to be on session four in the book tonight uh, and the title is called Serve and, and I this is a really cool lesson it's called uh, the point of the lesson is seize the opportunity to serve and I think that will make more sense as we go along in this passage of scripture but this guy talks about customer service now, we've all had experience in this. The cheapest place ain't always your favorite place, but so, if somebody goes out of their way to help you, they'll forever etch in, in, in your mind that they're uh, the people you want to be around. And this, it talks about this guy was on his way to see his grandson. His grandson was going to pass away in the Bible meets life. And I really like this. This story is very touching. He was on his way to meet his grandson, and he, and he got an emergency. He got a last minute ticket on a flight and he was on his way there but he was running late trying to see his grandson before his grandson died 
and he explains his situation to the person at the desk saying, I need to get to here, and I need to get here right now. Can you please give me a ticket on this plane? And yeah, he, said, he calls and tells him, I'm running late, but please, I need to be on that plane because my grandson's dying. And when he gets to the place where you check out his baggage, the pilot is waiting on him. And the pilot said, they can't leave without me, and I'm not leaving without you. So just calm down, we got this. You know what I mean? And so that, that kind of stuff right there is the kind of stuff that changes your mindset about people. You know, I mean, the, the, we, sometimes, you know, you, you encounter something or somebody and you, you realize, hey, there's, you know, God's still got a lot of good people in this world. And uh, that's what wins souls. That's what wins people to Christ is love in action. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Excuse my drinking. I got an easy throw. Anyway, the setting is in the book of, I mean, in, in, in Galatians, at the church of Galatia. And, and these believers are trying to transcend uh, into the Christian faith. Now, everybody that's been a new Christian is understands this to some extent because it's hard to wrap, you know, it, sometimes what church is bad about getting somebody baptized and leaving them sitting on the edge of the baptistry expecting them to know everything about everything, and they just don't know. And especially in a time where there is no written word. At this time when the church of Galatia has been established, the written word is not a there and so this is the written word Paul writes a letter to the church of Galatia trying to help them get over this obstacle uh, that's in front of them and one major obstacle that they have we're, uh, we're going to be in Galatians 5.13 is where we're going to start but in Galatians 5.1 uh, Paul begins this argument and I'm going to read a couple passages of scripture beginning in Galatians 5.1 it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he's obligated to the whole law. Who are you trying to be just? You are trying to be justified by the law have alienated from Christ and have fallen away from grace. Now that's some big words, Paul says. You have fallen away from grace. And, and for a minute, I want you to try to wrap your mind around what Paul's saying. The law, when Christ, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. We understand that he is the total completion of the law. But there are some parts of the law that were no longer necessary after Christ. You understand the sacrificial system, what, how are you going to offer a sacrifice after Christ has paid the entire price? There's no sacrifice needed. You know what I mean? The blood of bulls and goats never saved anybody anyway. But there's no sacrifice needed. So the sacrificial system, that's gone. And circumcision. Now, we, we still practice circumcision today because of health reasons, hygiene reasons. But it has nothing to do with salvation. But what they were trying to do was they were trying to say, I'm saved by Christ, but if you're going to be saved by Christ, first thing you got to do is meet some qualifications. You know, so they put more qualifications than just Christ. You got to get circumcised if you're going to be saved. If you're not saved, you know what I mean? And so Paul said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you go back to add man's stipulations to salvation, you have walked away from the cross and grace altogether. And in today's time, uh, we don't have as much problem with it as they did in Paul's time, but, but we still see people putting confidence in fleshly things so much. When you ask people why they're going to go to heaven, you get answers like, I was raised in church. My dad was a deacon. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. That's great, but why are you going to go to heaven? Well, I'm a good guy. I never killed anybody. I don't steal anybody. I go to work and I pay all my bills. Well, that's great. But why are you going to go to heaven? You know what I mean? But you remember when the person, and it took me a long time to figure this out. The Holy Spirit opened my mind to something. When Jesus said to his servants, I never knew you. you think about it. They said, but Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. Notice who their, what their excuse is when they get there. We done this. We done that. God, I went to church. I put an offering in. How can you say, I don't go to heaven? But if you're going to go to heaven on anything other than the work of Christ on the cross, 
And your faith in that work, you're not going. You know what I mean? If you're not going because you're in the blood of the Lamb, you're just not going. And so Paul says, you're going down the wrong road. And he goes on to say, you, how did you get deceived? You had it headed your way. How have you let yourself be deceived? And so now where we pick up tonight, he's trying to tell them how the law applies to them. And this is good stuff for us today. How does the, I mean, the Old Testament applies to me and you. He talks about the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Live by the fruits of the Spirit. And he talk, that's action, you know what I mean? Love you. And we, we're going to talk tonight about love and things of that nature. But how, how do you live that out? Because uh, we're not under the law, but under grace. But the, how does the Old Testament still apply? So Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, it says, Paul says to the church of Galatia, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you'll be consumed by one another. Man, I love this passage of Scripture. That They keep wanting to talk about what they're doing, you know what I mean? They say, well, I'm going to go to heaven. Why? Well, I got circumcised. You know, everybody wants everybody wants to have some kind of little pen to get them in, you know what I mean? And so Paul said, you're messing up. You're messing up. You don't understand the law. He said, you were called to be free. Now, that call is a, is a powerful word because it, you, you weren't just, you know, it wasn't just like you just come out of the dark someday and said, hey, I'm going to get saved. Every person was elected by God. God he courted your heart. He knocked on the door of your heart. You were called. You, you know what I mean? You, you, you remember the day that you were convicted? You know, that you, you just didn't, if, if you just woke up one morning and said, well, I'll tell you what, I need a little hell insurance. I think I'm going to get baptized today. You know, just in case. Then you need to be worried. You know what I mean? Because the Holy Spirit has to work in your life in order for you to be saved. And so you were called, but you weren't just called to salvation. You were called to freedom. You were called to free. You were called to be free. Christ died on the cross to set you free. Free from what? What did he set you free from? Sin. That's exactly right. And actually, he set you free from the law, and the power of the sin is the power of the law. You know what I mean? Sin's the power of the law. He set you free from sin because sin bound you. And how did the law, how did sin bound you? Because the law empowered sin to bind you. There is no sin where there's no law. There's no speed limit. It's real hard to write somebody a ticket. You know what I mean? But when they post the speed limit, all of a sudden there's a law. So if it, you're going 60 and a 55, you've broke the law. But if you're going 54, you're good. Because, hey, we've got a law here. So the law, we, we you know, it, there was only one rule in the Garden of Eden. Just one rule. If that rule hadn't been there, free choice wouldn't have been real. But in order for free choice to be real, there has to be the choice to disobey it. And so Jesus went to the cross and died for our sin debt because the law bound us by sin. You know, that, that, and, and so not only am I free from sin, but I'm also free from the law. The law has no, it, it, I, there's no fear of me in the law, because, for the law, because the law has no hold over me. I'm not under the law, but under grace. Now, if I, this is getting confused, and hopefully we'll bring this to the front. I mean, so... I'm not under the law anymore. Man, we got a lot of phones ringing up. <laughs> I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. That being said, what does it mean that I'm free from the law? Does that mean I can just sin all I want? That's exactly what Paul's saying here. He says, you, you're called to be free. God, he frees you from the law and from sin. But don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, in the Bible, Paul uses the sinful nature and the flesh. He uses those terms in tandem, in parallel. Those, they mean the same thing. The flesh and sinful nature. Paul said, what's that mean? I'm glad you asked. That means living based on how you feel. Now, I, this is a good way to start governing yourself. If you hear most of your arguments starting out with, I feel... I think and I want, then you're probably living for the wrong person's kingdom. You know what I mean? Because when I start living for the kingdom of God, 
then what I feel, what I think, and what I want in is not as important as what God feels, what God thinks, and what God wants, you know? And so when I'm living for the flesh, I'm my own God. I'm living for what I want. And Paul said, don't use this opportunity for freedom as a way to feed your flesh. Just because you're not under the law doesn't mean that God still doesn't want you to obey him. You know what I mean? If you go down the road and you yell out some profanity at this driver, well, you're not going to go to hell for it if you're under grace because Christ died for you yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But God's also not real happy with you because it's real hard to witness to a guy when you get to the stoplight that you just cussed on the way to the stoplight. You know what I mean? And so th that's what Paul's talking about here is don't use your freedom as an opportunity to please your flesh. Now, we see that a whole lot in our world today. A lot of people like the rules when it applies to somebody else. But the same people that are a stickler for the rules when it comes to everybody else stink in obeying the rules themselves. And so in that situation, who are they pleasing? Their own self, you know what I mean? And so if, if the rule applies, it applies to me, it applies to everybody. And so I can't use the grace as a, as the, it says other words, as a license to sin. I can't use the grace as a way for me to do what I want to do. Because, you know, as a Christian, we, we pick out somebody over there and say, oh, they shouldn't be doing that. But when it comes to us, they say, well, I'm free. You know? Well, that's what Paul's talking about. Don't use your freedom as a license to sin. But, but here's a play on words. But serve one another in love. You are free. Christ freed you from sin and enslaved you to love. That word right there, uh, man, I, my Greek is terrible, so I'm going to spell it out for you. D-O-U-L-E-U-E-T-E, -E, if you can say that, more power to you. But... Uh, the word translates to be owned by another, to be a slave. That, that word, when it says to serve one another, that's actually the word he used in the Greek. Christ sets you free from sin, but he called you to be enslaved to one another. Now, the Bible says you got to be a slave to something. Either you're a slave unto Christ, which leads to righteousness, or a slave unto sin, which leads to damnation. That's Romans chapter 6. Paul parallels that here by saying that he called us into slavery to one another. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in this one statement. Now Paul's getting to the rat killing. You want, you want to say something when you stand in front of God? You want, to, you want something to talk about when you stand in front of God? Don't take your Sunday school pen and say, look, you're a perfect attendance 10 years ago. If you want to stand in front of God with something to feel good about, stand in front of God saying, I put myself last and others first. You remember what Jesus said? Because you can just say, I just, you know, uh, James and John, here they come, and their mama had, had them both by the arm. You know what I mean? Jesus seen them come, and their mama had them, and they walked up there, and, 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 their, and their mama said, I want you to do me a favor. And Jesus said, all right, well, you want me. She said, when, you, when you're in your kingdom, I want one of my boys to sit on your right and one of my boys to sit on your left. Now, these are grown men. Yeah. They're the apostles of the church, for crying out loud. You know what I mean? And so Jesus doesn't, he doesn't direct any of his statements to their mama. When you go back and read the story, mama's totally out of the picture. Now he's talking to James and John. He says, you don't know what you're asking. See, I, I don't think mama, I think that they kind of went pouting to mama saying, I want to be first and I don't know how to be. And she said, I'll take care of it. You know what I mean? I don't know how they come about. But he looks at them and says, you don't know what you're asking. He said, can you drink of the cup I drank? And they said, well, sure we can. And he said, oh, you're going to. You're going to drink of the cup I drank. But the, the place is on my right and my left. They are already destined for those who earn them. My father will put those people there. If you want, and then he goes on to say one of his famous statements, if you want to be the greatest, be the least. That, that's literally what he said. If you want to be the greatest, make yourself the least. Stop putting yourself on a pedestal and start making yourself a servant and you'll be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. 
Well, Paul says pretty much the same thing. Don't use your freedom in Christ as a license to sin, but use it as a calling to serve God in his kingdom. You find out a way to, to do something to bring somebody closer to God. Now, you say, well, uh, what am I supposed to do? Well, he kind of highlights a little bit on what you're supposed to do, but what you're not supposed to do. Listen to what he says. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you'll be consumed by one another. Now, that word bite and devour, in the Greek, they would be a whole lot more than they are in English. The word bite is the word which meant for a snake to strike. You know what I mean? Snakes don't go around hunting people when they strike at them most of the time. Most of the time, if you get too close to a snake, he could... You know, I mean, he says, you better back up. And that's the way a lot of people are. You're all right over there, but just don't offend me. Because, you know, if you start walking on my turf, if you do something that offends me, then I'm going to strike, you know. And if that mindset in, in a Christian world stinks, you know what I mean? If you're just waiting for somebody to offend you so you can go off like a snake, somebody stepped on his tail, it's going to be really hard to display the love of Christ. And then the word devour is like a pack of dogs. It means like a pack of dogs just wearing somebody out. You know what I mean? Because that's the way they hunt. They they overpower and outnumber and just devour them, just just wear them down. And sometimes we suppress each other. You know, I mean, we don't. Maybe we we don't set out to do that, but we suppress each other. But not really for kingdom things, for selfish things. You, you, when you look around at church problems, are church problems kingdom problems or fleshly problems? Hardly ever do you hear a church split because one person says, I don't think God meant, I don't think God meant what he said when he said you had to be saved. I don't think Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. Hardly ever you hear that kind of stuff. You know, we're not falling out over big theological things. We're falling out over one person wants a piano and the other wants an organ. And so when you look at it, Paul says, you want to display Christ. You really, you really want to know what it looks like to have it. Love each other. Just love all over each other. Because Christ said, when they asked him what the greatest commandment was, he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said something to me that is absolutely phenomenal. All the rest of the commandments hang on them two. You keep them two, you can't break the rest. Now that's, that's pretty interesting, you know what I mean? And so Paul, he's right here in Galatians, and he's trying to combat this argument of uh, salvation by something I've done. But if you really want to do something, now think about it. If you really want to do something, let Christ live in you. That's pretty much what he said. If you really want to do something, let the love of Jesus shine to you. Because that's what a follower of Christ does. If, if you could just go to heaven by getting a tattoo on your forehead that said, I love Jesus. Well, well I mean, you know what I mean? That'd just be a whole lot easier, you know what I mean? Or if you could just get this little mark or something, you know. If you could just get a shot or whatever you had to do to get to heaven, just have some kind of sample surgery. But that's not the way it works. But that's the way everybody wants to work, you know what I mean? They want to say, well, I've, done, I've got my shot, you know. i got a guy, but that's not the way it works. Because submission to Christ comes with an action. You know, James said, faith without deeds is dead. And so Paul said... You want to do something that goes along with your freedom, love like Christ loved. Anybody got any questions? Because that's a whole lot of stuff in them two, three verses. Now, he's, our Sunday school lesson skips on over to chapter 6. And uh, this right here is a picture of what love looks like. In Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5, he says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Now carry on another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone, not to compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Again, there's a whole bunch of stuff in these five verses, but 
Paul, I, 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 you got to look at his head because he continues to use his head, brothers and sisters. And he's, he's not talking to people that ain't got skin in the game. He's talking to the church, you know what I mean? He, he's talking to the, the followers of Christ. He, he considers these people to be walking along beside him. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken and wronged, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. But he's talking to the church. Can somebody in the church be overtaken with wrongdoing? You better believe it. If, they, if, if they're real, they'll tell you that. You know what I mean? Sometimes you get all crossed up. Sometimes you get your head in the wrong direction. And, and sometimes you're just not living it out. And people around you start to notice he's not where he used to be. Now, you remember Jesus said, first get the plank out of your eye. And then get the sawdust out of your neighbor's eye. Sometimes we translate that, mind your own business, don't say nothing to your neighbor. That is not what Jesus meant by that. What he meant by that is focus on your life. You seek first the kingdom of heaven. You fix you. But he goes on to say here, this is magnifying that. If your brother is struggling and you see it, help him gently. With a spirit of restoration, not a spirit of condemnation, help him. And I have to say, and I've said this here before, if you got, if you got enough friends to fill up one hand as the kind of friends which you can tell anything you need to tell to, and they'll look at you with the same amount of respect when you get done, you're a blessed person. Amen. And if you got the kind of friend that'll tell you what you need to hear, whether it hurts your feelings or not, if you just got one of them, you're a blessed person. Because sometimes in this life, there are people that will love you right straight to hell. They'll just cheer you on when you're doing everything wrong and tell you all, oh, attaboy, when they ought to be telling you, man, what in the world are you thinking? And so Paul said, restore them gently. You who are spiritual. Now this is a challenge to the mature. This is a challenge to the spiritually mature. And sometimes, uh, we find out who the spiritually mature is in our life the hard way. To be spiritually mature is to be able to find out about somebody else's struggle and then go no farther than you. You know what I mean? To be spiritually mature is to know that a brother's struggling and to be trying to help them and to know some things that they wouldn't tell anybody else in the world and that secret be as safe as if they hadn't told anybody because there ain't no way that you're going to defy their confidence. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Well, you mentioned something long ago about uh, young believers. I think a lot of times uh, they get caught in kind of what you're talking about because they, they really don't know. And I find out as I live my life, uh, you know, I'm not probably the oldest anybody in here. I'm only older. But the point is, I'm making, I thought I knew a lot, but I found out as I grow older and study the Word, I find out I didn't know too much. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. One time, I never will forget it, James Lewis is dead and gone now, but I was taking a tree down somewhere. I didn't know, I, I, whatever I was doing was out of total ignorance, but I thought I was doing pretty good. You know, I can't remember what I was fooling with, but whatever the saw was. But I wasn't going my way. He came over and said, son, would it be a if I showed you something? I said, no, sir. Then he showed me whatever I was doing wrong for we lined it right up and it, it, it worked, you know what I mean? And he said, one time in my life I was doing, he came and told me what he was doing, said I worked till I was blue in the face. He said, I, I do believe with every ounce of my soul, if Paul hadn't wrote Romans chapter seven, I wouldn't be here today. Sometimes churchy people get to acting like they got it all together. And what they don't understand is some old boy walks in and he sits on the back row and everybody's got this cushy looking little life and everybody's got this cushy looking little story. And he walks out saying, I don't belong there because them people got it together. And Paul in Romans chapter 7 said, he just plumbed out and said, I don't have it together. What I want to years ago, whose life did you change if you was on? If you've seen somebody struggling and said, hey, man, I've been where you're at. And I just want to tell you something, not out of judgment or anything, but I love you. 
And I'm telling you, it don't got to be this way. There's a better life waiting. And if you do it out of love, you can tell somebody something out of love, and I guarantee you, if you tell them out of love, they might not like it, but they'll accept it if you sure truly tell them out of love. And so that's what Paul's talking about here. Be cautious. Because sometimes, whenever we're trying to uh, help somebody, he says to the elders of the church, Peter says, don't lord it over. Don't lord it over people. Don't act like the, you're the judge and jury, but act like you're a fellow brother that cares. You know what I mean? And from your you can see a little different. I tell Ricky sometimes, especially about guys I see that are where I used to be, I wish I could just take my eyes out for a few minutes and let them look through it. Because from where I'm standing, it's plain as day. And from where they're standing, they couldn't see it if it stood up waiting. You know what I mean? And, 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 and sometimes, you might not, maybe not everybody, but sometimes your story could change somebody's life. I think that's our church is more than anything. I think you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, we, we like to put on frills and we like to look good, but us to carry each other's burdens. What that word burden right there means the trials of life. Temptations and frustrations and things that just don't work out. You know, uh, we see somebody struggling with their marriage. We see somebody struggling with a kid. We see somebody's lost their job. Or we know somebody's having a hard time paying the bills. And you just turn your head the other way and you don't do anything. Well, let me just say what James says in James chapter 2. James says, if you see a brother hungry and you say to him, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for I'm going to pray that somebody will help you out. I wish you well. James says, if you see a brother that's hungry and you wish him well and don't do anything to feed him, where in the world is your faith? Now think about that. You know, the church will say, well, I pray for you, and walk away and never give that guy another dang thought in the world. That ain't the love of Christ. Christ had compassion. You know what I mean? So carry one another's burdens, which means be remorseful and be... Uh, compassionate and really care I can't everybody in this room knows how much it means when you're when you're going through a tough time in your life for somebody to call and tell you they love you and you're praying for you or the car and, and be really sincere and tell you they're praying for you or stop by with you that right there is like that's priceless because all of a sudden you realize I'm not in this by myself and so he says I, I'm this is a command carry one another's burdens because in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ what was the law of Christ love one another love. If you want to fulfill the law of Christ, care about each other. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Now think about that for a minute. If anybody values himself outside of what Christ is doing in him, we don't like to say those kind of things physically, but really when it comes to spiritual life, people don't like to say it at all. You know what I mean? Well, I want to tell you something. My hair is turning gray and my beard is turning gray and you can go out to the store and you can get something to change that. But sometimes your spiritual life is showing bad effects. And people want to cover that up too. You know what I mean? It, it ain't our physical parents. ain't the only thing we doctor up. We want to act like we got our spiritual life all together. But, you know, we done kind of figure it out. If somebody's 75 years old and they got perfect blonde hair. You know what I mean? I wasn't the sharpest tack in the box. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I didn't get straight A's by no means, but I done got that and figured out. Yeah. And, and the reality is, in your spiritual life, you can act like your life is perfectly together, but guess what? The people around you, they done got that and figured out. You know what I mean? The people that have never struggled, never had any problems, don't have... Come on. You know what I mean? And so Paul says, carry one another's burdens and don't overvalue yourself. Realize that without Christ, you're nothing. And I want to tell you something. The first step to being a successful minister, and that's what everybody's called to be, is realizing without Christ, you're nothing. You get that part down, you're on the way up from that. Because that's humility. God exalts the humble and humbles the exalted. If you choose to humble yourself, realizing you're nothing without Christ, you got that part out of the way, you know, and then we can go up from here. And so, let each person, now this part right here is where it sounds like, let each person examine his own work and then we, he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with somebody else. This is big because he says each person 
must carry his own load. Now, he just said, help your brothers carry their burdens, and now he says everybody's got to carry their own load. Some people say, what in the world is he talking about? He contradicted himself. No, he didn't, because he's talking about something totally different now. He was talking about burdens up there, and the load he's talking about is your responsibility in Christ. That's everybody has got to stand good for their own responsibility. When's the last time you heard somebody come on TV that's some big time leader and say, I tell you what, I messed that up. That was all bad. That was on me. That was a dumb idea. I messed that up, but we're going to fix it and do something different. I mean, people just don't own their mistakes. People just don't make mistakes. You know what I mean? They don't know who done the wrong, but it wasn't them. Well, the reality is we're all messed up. We're all sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. We all mess up every day. And so I got to, I have let each person examine his own work. Now, I'm going to just go on ahead and confess something. I have never considered myself a liar. But there's one person in this life I've lied to a lot, and that's me. And I made myself a vow that me and me was going to be straight shooters from now on. From now on, I will be honest with myself. Because I have told myself so many times I didn't have a problem. And all I, or he says, every person examine his own work. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Well, I'm better than that old boy. Yeah. When you get to heaven, that old boy is not going to be who you're comparing to. Every person has got to stand good for their own responsibility. Jesus, he made a difference between the one with five and the one with three and the one with one. You remember that parable? In other words, you're going to be asked what you've done with what he did. You're not, he's not going to ask you what you've done with what your neighbor had. But what did you do with what I gave you? And so I got to examine my own self and I got to ask myself, am I doing what God asked me to do? Am I loving people? Am I seeking the kingdom of God? Am I trying to tell people about Christ? You know, because sometimes the easiest person in the world to deceive is you. We get to thinking we don't have a problem. We don't have uh, an issue with pride. That's been my major thing for me. And it's just, just I mean, if, if I, at one time, really believed that I was all right in the pride area. I know that sounds terrible, but I did. And you want to know something? The number one side of pride is if you think you have no problem with pride. Amen. I've done figured that out. <laughs> If you think you have no problem with pride, you're already to stage four. Okay? And it's going to take a miracle from Christ to fix you. And that's exactly what I realized. I didn't think I had a problem with pride. And then when I started reading with it, about it, and studying it in God's Word, I said, man, I'm eat up with pride. You know, it's done with the, all my spiritual self. And the reality is only God can set you free from that because you have to claim your work in Christ. Examine yourself, and then you can take pride in yourself. Now the Bible speaks plainly against pride, so what's he talking about there? You can take pride in who you are in Christ. Paul said, I won't boast about myself, but a man like God made me. He said, I know a man who was called up to the third heaven. Now I'll boast about a man like that, but about myself, I will not boast. What Paul's saying is, I'm proud of what God done through me. But I am not proud of what I've done on my own. What I've done on my own is nothing. But I am thankful and proud of what God done through me. That's what Paul was trying to say. And you can be proud of what God has allowed you to be. You know, he, I, the Bible says he put his message in jars of clay. And that's what you are, a jar of clay. But you can be mighty proud to be a jar of clay because of the content. That's what I am. I, I know I'm not, there ain't no pride in a jar. But I'm not who I used to be, and I sure am thankful for that, and it's all of Christ is all the credit, you know what I mean? And so that's what Paul's talking about, is examine yourself and take pride in what Christ has allowed to happen in your life. Point all the glory to God. It's not you you're proud of, but what Christ has done through you. For everybody's got to carry their own load. Everybody's going to give an account for themselves. Everybody. And, and you're entrusted... God has entrusted you with something. Somebody says, I don't have a talent. Well, that won't be right. You, you, you got, God called you to do something. You know what I mean? And I have confidence that when you put yourself in God's hands, you, you're going to be a success story. Nobody in the world would have thought that a little kid with a rock had a chance against a champion. 
when God took a champion's own sword and cut his head off with it with a little kid with a rock. You know what I mean? So he puts what you've got in God's hands and watch it go from there. That's, that's who God is. And so Paul said, everybody's got to carry their own. Realize this. He, he says something in 10. This is verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10, that I love so much. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. Now, the reason I like this word so much is because that, I don't have the tongue roll thing for the Greek, but the, the Greek word keros, and he spoke to me this week in the backyard, you know what I mean? It's not a coincidence that God is keep bringing you to this person that you know is broken hearted or that he keeps putting this person on your mind every day and you just can't get them off your mind. That's not a coincidence. This is an opportunity brought on by God, so make the most of it. If you believe in coincidence, you, you need to rethink, you know what I mean? Because God gives us opportunities. He, gives, he puts people in our pathway, and he gives us opportunities to encourage people. He gives us opportunities to... To just be a blessing to people, to help them out, you know what I mean? He gives us opportunities to serve him. And when we see that opportunity, you know, we need to make the most of it. Now, I have to be honest, and me and Ricky's talked about this. There's been times I've been driving away from somebody. I just left them. I'm in the truck on the way home, and all of a sudden, this little light goes on my head that says, You idiot. They were fishing. They was asking questions, and you were so naive that you missed it. You know what I mean? I mean, I had an opportunity. They were kind of setting it up to ask a question about God, and I was so clueless at the time. I was so focused on what I wanted to get done that I have totally missed this opportunity. So that's what Paul's talking about is have your eyes open for the opportunity God has given you. Now, uh, especially those in the household of faith, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because you ought to be each other's biggest cheerleader. I ought to be every other Christian's biggest cheerleader because he said I was supposed to carry everybody's burdens. When somebody's down, I need to cheer them on. Well, I, and you can't do that if you're not reading people and trying to figure out where people are in their life. This is what I'm going to tell you. Has nothing. This is not bragging on me because... Uh, this ain't got nothing to do with me. But me and Becky, we, we try to pray every morning. And one week, I prayed every morning that God would give me an opportunity to share my faith. And I mean, I really prayed. I wouldn't just lay me down to sleep praying. And that, that Friday, I baptized two people. Not in church service. Just, just out of nowhere, you know what I mean? All of a sudden, there's an opportunity. And so me and her was talking about that and said, just maybe what we should be doing is praying like that every week. You know what I mean? I mean, it worked out great that week, but what about the rest of the 51 weeks a year? I mean, because I spend a lot of my life so little narrow, you know what I mean? Like a horse with blinders on. I know what I need to get done today, and I want to get it done, but sometimes I walk right past somebody that is so open to the gospel, and I, I just miss it because I didn't have my eyes open. And so that's what Paul's talking about is make the most of the opportunity. If you know somebody's hurting, if you know they're down, do something. You know, cheer them on. Send them a card. Call them on the phone. Stop by their house. If you can, I guarantee you, if you can find a point of interest that you share in God, you're on the road to a spiritual conversation. That's all you got to do is develop some sort of relationship. You go visit somebody, and they got a fish on the wall or, you know, a deer mounted or some old thing that you, you know, that your grandmother had. Just start a conversation to build a relationship. Anything, you know what I mean? Anything. Try to get in somebody's life. Because if you just walk up to somebody, well, I heard you's lost. <laughs> it's going to be real hard to get them saved. You've got to show them you love them. You know what I mean? You've got, to, you've got to show interest in somebody. And that's what Paul was talking about is love like Christ loved. Because there's one word that just echoes all through the gospel. Jesus had compassion on the people. You want to know what made him addictive? He had compassion on the people. 
They couldn't get away from it. I mean, he loved them. He, he cared for them. He gave them the time of day. He actually cared more about their need than he did about what he had to get done. And he healed the broken and he, the lame and the beaten down and the spiritually dead. He, he, he revived them. You know what I mean? He, he was that, that, that's who he was. And so uh, with that being said, this guy, this guy sums up like this, and, I, and I, it's good stuff. It says, thank somebody who's helped you carry a burden in your life. And I, I mean, just think about how you got where you are and the people God put in your path to, to cheer you on and to pick you up. And I mean, the people that told you about your faith. And if you have an opportunity and those people still living, thank them. Because you wouldn't be where you are without them. Restore somebody. I love this right here. If you're in a situation, or if you, if you have a family member or somebody that's in the mix of a bad situation, and you have an opportunity to help fix that situation, to just even if it ain't never going to be the same again, if you can just kind of bring some kind of peace in that person's life, some kind of meaning. Hey, it's kind of like a bad relationship. I, you know, I get to talk to people and they've been through a divorce and. It ain't never going to be, it ain't never going to work out. They done got to the place in the road where they figured it ain't never going to work out. What do we need to do? Hey, love your other. Love them. They're going to be your child's parent for the rest of their life. Love them. You know, they never ever be your spouse again, but love them. You know what I mean? Pray for them. Wish the best on them. That's how you, and so if somebody's really struggling and they're broken, you can encourage them in Christ. You know what I mean? You, to, to, to love on that person and and so ask God to give you wisdom to talk to somebody that's in a bad situation, if, even if you're not even in the situation. But if you are, it's even more important that you have a package of it. And, and, the, and the second one is, it, and the last one it says is serve somebody. Now we're not going to do exactly what it says. It says to identify individuals that have a burden you can help. But if God has placed somebody on your heart, I don't know... I know there's other people in this room that's been through this, but there's been times that there's been somebody on my mind every single day for some reason. And I just go see them, and then all of a sudden, when I leave there, I say, you know, thank you, God, because they's in a real tough place. And, you know, that, that, I mean, you hear stories on Caleb every day about people that said they had a cock pistol in their hand, and all of a sudden the phone rung, and somebody on the other end said, man, I've had you on my mind. I can't get you off my mind. I just want you to know I love you and I'm praying for you. And then all of a sudden, it's a haul to get a different ball game. Then now they can't do it because somebody loved them. Five minutes ago, nobody in the whole wide world loved them in their mind because, and what would it be if you would have said, yeah, I'm too busy, I'll call them late. You know what I mean? So that's, that's what Paul should serve somebody. You know, find somebody you can help. Somebody that's just down and out, maybe you can just, you know, you can help somebody buy food if they're hungry, but I think one of the neatest things you can do for anybody is to invest time in their life. Just have enough time to say hello and how you doing and, how, and really actually have a genuine concern for somebody's situation. It's, it's the best thing anybody's ever done to show the love of Christ. Anybody got any questions before we close up? Or comments or anything? If not, and you bow with us, Eddie Horn, would you dismiss us, please? Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, Lord. Yes, Lord. Church, family, kind of coming back together, Lord. Lord, I know I sure am ready for it, and I think we all are, Father. We just thank you. Lord, just ask that you be with our country, be with our leaders, Lord. Lord, we use this to bring our country. Father, just, Lord, just help people just to realize, Lord, that we got to have you, Lord. We need to put you back at first place, Father. As we've drifted away from you in lots of ways, Lord. And Father, I, I, I just feel like that this could bring our country back. And I just hope that, as Brother Derek says, Lord, it's just a great revival. Lord, our community, our state, and our country, Father, I'd love to see a worldwide revival. It was always on our prayer list, Father. Lord, just guide and direct us in all we do. Lord, we thank you for you. In your name we